So we can start now. Okay, then uh, greetings and welcome to everyone. We just do our normal housekeeping announcements. Please mute your microphone and turn off your video until we get to the question and answer section. You can ask questions at any time. Yeah, please go to mute. You can ask questions at any time using the chat box. Just type them in or raise your hand during the Q&A session. When you're invited to speak, please unmute and turn on your video, but only when you're invited to speak, please keep your videos on off and your microphone on mute. You will receive the webinar recordings. You will receive the slide deck. As always, these expert sessions, the main objective is to give you a chance to ask any questions. I will summarize two aspects of the module and then invite questions. Yeah. So our agenda for today is the first presentation, about 25 minutes. What's so new about new technologies? Then a 10 minute Q&A session. Then the second presentation, about 25 minutes on the supply chain management requirements for new health technologies. How does it affect us? And then a second Q&A session. So we start with new technologies. Well, what's so new? We've always had new technologies. Throughout our entire career, there's always been new medicines coming along. There's always been new devices. There's always been new medical surgical items. So what's so important about these new technologies? And really the, the driving force around these new technologies is computing power. And that is the massive increase in computing power is what's driven these new technologies. And we talk about Moore's law. And for those people who don't know about computers so much, Gordon Moore recently died in March of this year, but he formulated a law that states that on a microchip, it will double the number of transistors on a microchip every two years. And that means that every two years, computing power will double. Well, in fact, Moore's law no longer holds. Now, the doubling takes place every three to four months, not two years. So within a year, you've doubled three times. A massive, massive increase in computing power. And that's made a lot more computer-driven devices available to us, which weren't available before. Now they can be available because there's much more computing power and it's a lot cheaper. But not everything we do needs computing power. You don't need a computer to work a syringe and a needle. But the computing power can help us manufacture a better needle. We can manufacture quinky points. That is very sharp needles that enter easily and don't core, don't block by the flesh going inside the needle when we enter. So even though the devices themselves, the medicines themselves may not be computer driven, we still use computers to design them. And that's had an impact as well on the design of many devices and new medicines as well. But we shouldn't get too overawed by the technology. Technology doesn't necessarily help people. It has to be harnessed. It has to be brought towards healthcare to do that. But another key feature is the pace of change is accelerating massively. As always, I will take the World Health Organization definition of health technology. That's the application and organizing of knowledge and skills, device, medicines, vaccines, procedures, and systems. What does that mean? 
Well, we're probably not used to thinking about software as medical technology, but it is. We're probably not used to thinking about medicines as technology, but they are. The way we design new medicines now is often using computers to formulate what will happen. So there's a huge range of medical technology. And we use this WHO definition to include all of it, including software, which until now we've not really handled as supply chain. There are around half a million medical devices in use, a huge number, used to prevent, diagnose, treat and monitor patients. How can we possibly understand all of them? How can we possibly come to terms with them? Everything from simple eyeglasses through to nanocarriers for drug delivery. Some of the COVID vaccines, the newer vaccines, use that kind of nano delivery particles. And there's a huge range of different ones, bioprinting, nanobiotics, regenerative medicine, all these different areas involved in the development of these new technologies. A huge range, and often we don't think about all of them. We only think about one or two little areas. We have to open our mindset to try and think about all of them because shortly we'll be handling all of them. But why now? We've always had new technologies. Why now? Well, one of the key reasons is 20 years ago, the Global Fund, along with Unitaid, and especially the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, invested huge amounts of money in research and development for new technologies for what they call PRNDs poverty-related neglected diseases. So diseases like cholera, nobody was working on a new medicine. Until 10 years ago, we had no new TB medicine for 45 years. Nobody was doing any research on diseases of poverty. And that's most of our countries. Our main diseases are diseases of poverty, the PRNDs. We used to call them neglected tropical diseases, but they're not just tropical. They're really in low-income countries. They invested a huge amount of money in research for these diseases, and they formed these product development partnerships, these PDPs. So they themselves didn't do the research, Global Fund didn't do the research, and Bill Gates didn't do the research. But they went to an organization that was a specialist in the area and said, here's a load of money. Go and give us new technology to address these diseases. Well, 20 years later, now these diseases are coming off the pipeline. All the new technology, all the new products are now coming through the pipeline. In 2001, we were getting one or two a year. Now, we have 585 per year new technologies coming out of the pipeline that affect us, that affect the diseases in our countries. That's the big change that's happened. We're looking at new vaccines, we're looking at new therapeutics, and especially new preventions. If we look at the breakdown, lots of areas where there are new products coming off Tuberculosis, we've had nothing for 40 years. We've been using the same old medicines. We've been getting MDRTB, XDRTB. Now we've got medicines. Now we've got new diagnostics to address this disease because of this huge investment that was made. They're coming off the pipeline now. Even areas like shigosis, rotaviruses, been completely neglected. Now, because of this huge investment, technologies are coming off the pipeline. Massive number of areas, massive number of products. Well, that's all good, but what's that got to do with PSM? That's all clinicians and healthcare and doctors. Well, 
these products are no good if we don't get them to the patient. If we don't have a mechanism for access and delivery, they're no use at all. We just think, 10 years ago, there was a new medicine for tuberculosis, quinoline. Even now, 10 years later, less than 40% of countries are using it. It's not being taken up, it's not being delivered. If we don't deliver it, if it doesn't happen, it's no use at all developing the technology. We have to have access and delivery of these products. And that means that we have networks and supply chain that have the capacity to deliver these products. Well, what does it mean for PSM? Three key areas. First, in prevention. Well, we've had vaccines for a long time and we've had bed nets for quite a long time, 10 years more now. But we're now getting completely new vector control products for prevention. Not just insecticides and pesticides and sprays, completely new products, 35 new products. Think about the impact that bed nets had. Think about the capacity, the size that you needed to store and distribute the bed nets. And now you've got 35 new products coming. There's a massive change in diagnostics. Not just the items, but where the items are used. In the past, the diagnostics have largely been focused on the laboratory. But the rapid test kits are not used in the laboratory. They're used in the clinics and they're used by the community health workers. So now just delivering to a few laboratories, I've now got to deliver a lot and there are 93 new diagnostic products, not just to a few clinics, but every community health worker because they're doing the malaria tests. So I have a different delivery point, a different distribution network, as well as the volume of new products. And point three, the pace of change. We've got a huge number. 463 new products are coming out the pipeline. We've had nothing for 40 years. Now we've got 463 new products arriving. Far greater pace of change, far greater volumes than we've seen in the past. Well, what's the impact of this? Well, you've already seen these technologies have a massive impact. You've already looked at rapid malaria diagnostic tests and bed nets, but the new products are going to have an even greater impact for storage volumes. Are you going to have enough warehouse space? Physical distribution volumes. Think about the bed nets again. Huge volume to distribute. And we have a lot new prevention products. Change in the endpoint delivery, not just a few laboratories on the diagnostics, now every clinic, every community health worker. Much faster response times. We can't wait 10 years to adopt these new products. We've got to get them in the system and moving through and delivered. Let's look at some practical examples. Most of you will be familiar with the changeover on TB diagnostics. When we move from microscope slides and doing stains to gene expert kits, we went from a box of microscope slides, almost nothing, to a pallet load of gene expert kits. More storage space, more distribution required. That change from microscope slides to gene expert kits was a 30-fold increase in volume. But we coped with that, we managed, and most countries are now using gene expert kits for the TB. But what about some of the newer items coming along? What about the LAM urine test for TB? Maybe soon we won't have to mess around collecting sputum. All these people coughing into little bottles in the clinic, not very nice. We might be able to do a urine test for TB using a system called LAM. 
Lipo Abenin Mananon. Don't worry too much about these difficult names. We can just call it lamb. Well, what about that? What the impact of that lamb test going to have on us? And it's a rapid test, not so much different to the COVID or the HIV test that you're used to, except this one uses urine. And if we look at a population of 30 million, medium-sized country, might be 300,000 patients on HIV, we might need to do 100,000 TB tests among those, we turn out with, I would need about one pallet load. So that wouldn't make a big difference. It's about the same as the gene expert. I wouldn't have a big impact on my storage, wouldn't be a big impact on my distribution. So if we were to adopt the lamb kits, that wouldn't be a big problem. Point about this is for you to get used to doing this kind of calculation before the technology arises so that you are ready. When the technology comes along, you can say, it's okay, we can manage that. We have enough space, we have enough distribution capacity. You need to be doing these kinds of calculations. Have I got enough space? Well, what about malaria using the new LAMP system for asystematic cases? That's people who've got malaria, but they have no symptoms. There's no fever, there's no shivers and shakes, but I need to treat them if I'm going to eliminate malaria. So I have to be able to diagnose them. And the new system is called LAMP, Loop Mediated Isophil Amplification. We'll just call it LAMP, shall we? Much more sensitive, get a rapid test. Gonna show up the asystematic people, wonderful. And it comes with quite a complex little kit like this. It comes in a little suitcase. The main point for us is the top left there, the reagents that are needed, the consumables that are needed. What is that impact going to have on my supply chain? Well, if I tested a million people for malaria, I would need around 200 pallet loads. Is that going to have an impact on your supply chain? Have you got 200 spare pallet spaces in the warehouse? Have you got another 10 trucks ready to distribute. So if you adopt this item, it's going to have a massive impact on your storage and distribution. But if you did this calculation, you would be prepared for it. You would be ready, be able to adopt it. That's why we have to link with the new technologies so that we prepare the supply chain for the new technologies so that we're getting ready for them. Well, what impacts are these new technologies going to have on the overall procurement and supply chain management? Well, on the organizational structure, it will be a major impact. But we need reform anyway, especially post-COVID. We've got to change that. We've got to become more urgent. We've got to become more flexible. We've got to become more responsive. We've got to focus more on healthcare goals and less on administrative convenience. Back to patient focus, a patient-centric focus in our overall policies. What's the impact gonna be on supply chain human resources? Massive. I need much greater product knowledge. How many of you know about these lamp and lamb kits? I'm going to need management ability. I'm going to need much greater supply chain ability to manage all these new items and much greater financial modeling. What's it going to cost? Not the items, but the supply chain. What's it going to cost me to store and distribute all these items? Impact on supply chain finance, moderate. Because I'll need some more money, but I probably won't need a lot more money if I plan my supply chain correctly. What's the impact on supply chain infrastructure like warehouses and trucks and distribution capacity? Major. I'm going to need a lot more space. I'm going to need more space in the pharmacy, lab stores. I'm going to need a lot more distribution capacity. And in order to control all of this, I'm going to need much better information technology and communication. 
So these new technologies are going to drive massive changes in the procurement and supply chain management. But they come at a time when my supply chain is already stressed. We're just recovering from all the impact, all the disruption of COVID. And now you're going to hit me with all these new technology challenges. Yes, it's going to require a lot of management change, a lot of management adaption to get ready. But they can be managed. It's not difficult to make the calculations I've just shown you. How much space do we need? All I need to know is the volume and the number. I'm used to doing quantifications. You've done quantifications in module three. You've done storage estimates in module five and six. You're able to do this. So if you can prepare yourselves, you can manage these impacts. You can manage these changes, which in many cases are long overdue. We need to do that. We have a chance to eliminate malaria, not just control it. We have a chance to eliminate it if we can treat asymptomatic patients. To do that, I need diagnostic kits. Supply chain can manage the volumes, even if it's 200 ballots, if we plan, if we organize, if we get ready for it. That would be a massive achievement. Okay. All right, it's time for our first Q&A. Do we have anything in the chat box? Just good evening. Okay, right then. All right then. Okay, if you have any questions, please type them in the chat box or raise your hand and I'll ask you to unmute. Everyone too shocked, no questions. Uh -uh. If you want, you can just unmute and speak, if that's easier for you. How is the industry addressing environmental impacts of new technologies? Well, frankly, largely they are not. The industry is doing very little. If we look at the environmental impact of COVID, there was very little planning went into that. What happened to all the COVID test kits once they've been used? All that plastic went into the environment. This time, it's not really being addressed, but it is an area that we are going to have to address more and more, and that's in the waste management courses that we have available. Okay, uh, okay from uh, Modest, uh, frequent to see equipment not being used. Yes, certainly much of the major equipment we estimate it's got better. It used to be 80% was lying idle. We think it's only about 50% now, but a lot of it is not used. But this is not really just equipment. The rapid diagnostic tests generally get used. Okay, uh, on two ton. Please unmute and ask your question. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, there's a lot of investment in the new technologies uh, and supplies. And so uh, the new equipment and uh, new accessories are coming at, uh, in this year. But uh, when we, uh, but uh, those are sometimes, you know, uh, very difficult to assess and are very expensive. So uh, people have a limited access in terms of uh, financial barriers or uh, for example, uh, uh, previously we only have our uh, injection uh, depot, uh, midazine progesterone acidics uh, for the IM, but now it is in, uh, changing as a, a sign of press or with the previous syringe. But uh, only the, the medical company or uh, Pfizer uh, is uh, you know registered as their uh, uh, own uh, intellectual properties or right or something like that. So at the point, our people have. It is more expensive, more than uh, three to four, four times than the normal one. And uh, even though the result is the same uh, uh, and efficacy is the same. And so that uh, uh, it would be more easy to use, but uh, in terms of uh, uh, financial, uh, it is more uh, three to four times expensive than the normal one. 
So uh, how could we make it uh, more accessible and uh, more affordable for the people, especially for those who are in the developing in or low and middle in income countries? Uh, thank you. Okay, so the, the, the simple answer to your question is called market shaping. If we look at the situation on the new TB medicine, not so new now, but a quinoline, it was at first very expensive. So World Health Organization entered into, with Stop TB, a program of market shaping. That is, they went to the manufacturers and guaranteed order quantities, and that brought the price down. And we're seeing more of this market shaping going on now. If we look at COVID vaccine, we can say that was a market shaping failure. We didn't get the price down, we didn't get the volumes. But in other areas, market shaping has brought the price down into the affordable range. Also, part two, I'll be talking about the WHO assessments on the new technology and include the financial assessments of what is financially practical and affordable for low-income countries. So yes, it's difficult to adopt it, but I think with market shaping, that will bring it down. Okay, now, uh, two questions in here. What's so significant about treating asymptomatic malaria? Okay. Mosquitoes do not generate malaria. They transmit malaria. So to get malaria, they have to bite an infected person. So if nobody's got malaria, nobody gets malaria. The mosquitoes in the United Kingdom can transmit malaria. They don't because nobody's got malaria. So nobody gets malaria. So if you want to eradicate malaria, you have to treat all the people who've got malaria. Now, the symptomatic people, the people with fever, that's relatively easy. They'll come for treatment. But there's a group of people who have malaria and don't have any symptoms. But if a mosquito bites them, the mosquito will become infected and will transmit the malaria. So you have to treat the asymptomatic cases. And that means you need a diagnostic technique that will identify the asymptomatic cases. That's the point around eradication. To get to that level, you need to treat, diagnose and treat asymptomatic malaria. Mosquitoes don't create malaria, they only transmit it. Okay, what's the estimated burden from these new technologies with regard to waste management of their consumables? It is significant, but it is within the scheme of things generally low because most of it can be handled quite well. There are exceptions. There are some toxic materials mixed in there. There are some lab items in particular, which can be toxic, but most of it hasn't got a massive environmental impact, but it's there. And as we get to more of them, more disposable rapid testing kits, we'll have to look at waste management far more seriously than we do at present. Right now, what happens to all the plastic cassettes from the rapid malaria testing, the rapid HIV testing? They're not really recycled. They're not, they're really adding to the environmental burden. And as we increase the diagnostics, we'll be increasing that as well. So there is a waste management issue to address. All right, any more questions? We have time for a little bit more if we have them. You can just unmute and ask the question if that's easier. Okay, then I'll go ahead with part two and hopefully we'll get more questions after part two. If we look at the current situation of procurement and supply chain management, many of our systems are grossly stretched. They've been chronically underfunded for years. 
And frankly, we're using obsolete methodologies. And often we don't even know how bad they are because we don't have the data. We're not even able to collect all the key performance indicators that will tell us how good or how bad they are. And at the same time, we've had extra commodities. Global funders ramped up HIV, TB and malaria. So our systems are stretched by all those extra commodities, especially the diagnostics, because they're large volumes. Items like bed nets going through our system. So the systems are pressured. And now I'm saying to you, you've got to handle a whole pile more. How are we going to be able to cope with that? How are we going to be able to manage with that when we've just come through COVID and we're already really stressed? If we look at the public health supply chain today, most of it is aid dependent. So the big money, HIV, TB, malaria, is coming from the donors, rather from financial development within our own country. Our population is generally rural and low income areas. That's the one we're addressing because they're the ones with the diseases. And our diseases are mainly infectious diseases, HIV, TB, malaria. You've also got family planning to consider because that's quite high volume commodities as well. We've got a pile of global agencies and we've got country governments running central medical stores and supply chains. And we've got the private sector who generally look after the urban market. That's where we are today. If we look at the forecast now for 2030, on the economy, the donors are all cutting back. They're all saying you've got to start self-financing. So now you're going to have to look at using government money. And the population, there's a disease burden shift. Won't just be low income areas in the rural areas, there's urban areas as well. The disease burden is shifting, not just infectious diseases, but the NCDs, the non-communicable diseases. The country governments are trying to find the money to pay for all of this. And the global agents are starting to step back from this and saying, well, we've supported you for 40 years. It's now time that you do it on your own. And the private sector is really profit driven. And they're looking at fast innovation and leapfrogging to where the big money is. So we've got to look at a whole range of changes happening to us as well that's going to pressure our supply chain. We've got rising income levels, shifting disease burdens, urbanization, more people living in the cities, and the whole pace of change is going much faster. We look at this change from infectious diseases. Well, if you've got cholera, you will take erythromycin, 250 milligrams four times a day for seven days, and that will probably take care of it might need to go for another second course of seven days. But if you've got hypertension, a non-communicable disease, you'll be taking treatment every day for the rest of your life. That's a 50-fold increase in the volume of medicine that I need. Instead of one week, it's now 52 weeks a year that I need the medicine. So moving to these non-communicable diseases as the population gets more income level and starts to age, we will see a big impact on the supply chain. What does this mean? The new health technology is coming on top of all these other changes that are going on. The change from infectious diseases to non-communicable diseases. And we've got to do it faster. We've got to try and adopt more and bring back a prime healthcare, a patient centric focus while we're doing all of this. Sounds impossible, doesn't it? How can we do all of it? We're already stretched. We've got to have a major change 
in the way we approach procurement and supply chain management. How is our technical knowledge of the new products? Well, often it's very low. We don't have that knowledge. And we can't be expected to compile it. Very few doctors get much computer training at doctor school. Very few pharmacists get much computer training at school of pharmacy. Yeah? So we're going to have to bring technical experts working with the supply chain. We can't expect to have all this range of knowledge ourselves. We're going to have to work with more stakeholders, with more people bringing in the expertise that we need, especially for the diagnostics and the preventative items. How is our knowledge of the state of the market for new products? We're going to procure them. We need to know about the market. Well, often it's very low. If I'm sitting in Zambia or Mozambique, how do I know about the global market in these new lamp kits? So again, we've got to rely on global market shaping. And that means being plugged into WHO market shaping reports gaining that information. I can't expect to know it all in the procurement unit, but I can be expected to know the sources of the information, where there is guidance, where there is support available to me. I need rapid acceptance of the new products. It's often slow. It's usually at least three years to add a new product. In a sense, that's good for the supply chain because it gives me some time to prepare for the new products. I need highly flexible systems to adapt to these new technologies. But most of the systems I've got are really rigid and bureaucratic and they're difficult. I've got to change that. These new products, they're going to have unstable and erratic usage. As I add the new products and the uptake suddenly goes rapidly and takes off exponentially. And Right now, my monitoring is very low. It's old fashioned. My forecasting is not very good. I don't have real time reporting and tracking of usage. So it needs a lot more new technology in the supply chain itself, giving me real time reporting of what I've got, where I've got it, expiry dates and its condition. I'm going to have to cope with massive changes in distribution volumes. And right now, I don't have any spare capacity. It's already often overwhelmed. I've got stuff stacked down the aisles because I don't have enough shelf space. I've got to plan for a lot more storage space than we currently have. Major changes required. We need those anyway, but the new health technologies will drive those changes, will force us to adopt them quicker than we perhaps otherwise would. What else do I need? Cope with massive changes in the distribution endpoint. No longer just a few laboratories. I now got to get to the community health workers who are doing the job. Little recognition about that. All the last mile delivery. I'm going to have to address last mile delivery. Right now, many of our systems don't even deliver to clinics. They deliver to hospitals and demand the clinics come and collect themselves. I'm going to have to look much more detail at last mile delivery. I've got the technical aspects. And again, I haven't got the knowledge of these new products. I'm going to need to work with stakeholders who do have that knowledge and ability and know about the guidance that is available. Some of these products are high value. I'm going to need to have security for them. And again, most of our systems aren't that secure. We don't have a really good addressing security issues. I need to look at that more carefully in the future. Lots of things I need to do, but how are we going to do them? The organizational structure, a major mindset approach, a new philosophy. Simplify, less tears, last mile delivery, patient-centric focus has to be our way forward. Thinking of what is necessary for the patient, not 
administrative convenience. Many of our systems have been very bureaucratic and have been built up around that administrative convenience. A new business method. We're not really in business in the public health, but if we adopt the private sector terminology for now, how are we going to do that? Lots of stakeholders. I'm going to need real-time data. I've got to know what is where. And that means barcode scanning, more computerization, information technology throughout my system in order to do that. Much more organization, much more collaboration, working with all these different stakeholders. What does it mean? Major change to policies for product registrations or procurement rules, new guidelines, new manuals, new patient-centric approaches, major changes to the number of points of care that I need to deliver to, and appropriate manuals and systems for that. Patient-centric. What does it mean? Putting the patient needs at the center of the requirement. Right now, most of our systems are not patient-centric. Why do we do quarterly deliveries? Because it's convenient. Not because that's best for the patient. We have to change the mindset. What's best for the patient here? And move the whole costing, move the old ethos of the system towards patient-centric operations. Financial management, I need a lot more money. How am I going to get all this money I need for all these changes I've just talked about? We're going to have to advocate and we're going to have to have sound financial models. If you want to do this, I need this and that's what it's going to cost. If you will want to adapt, adopt the lamp kits, then I need 200 pallet spacers. I need this much warehouse. I need this much distribution and build that in from the start. Too often, supply chain has just been told, do it. Nobody asked you about the rapid diagnostic kits for HIV. They were just dumped on you and you had to cope. Nobody asked you about the rapid diagnostic kits for malaria. They were just dumped on you and you had to cope. We have to change that. We have to start to advocate for supply chain. If we're going to adopt these technologies, this is what we need. And that means that you are ready with plans for what you need and financial models for what you need. Right now, less than 5% of global fund grants have anything, any request at all for procurement and supply chain strengthening. They're all asking for the product. How are you going to handle the product? when you don't ask for any money. We have to get used to asking for money. And that means building models and building financial models. It means supply chain is organized enough to advocate and request, even when we're given the chance. On the PSM plan, we don't ask for the money. That has to change. Planning for what we need, not just allowing people to dump product on us and saying cope. Human resources, far more technical, doesn't mean that you necessarily have to acquire all these technical skills. You don't have to become a computer expert, but you do know how to interact with computer experts, how to work with stakeholders, how to understand when you need specialist knowledge. How do you acquire it? How do you get it into the system? Building that resource base. Not that you personally must know everything, but you must know someone who does know and you can consult with them, bring it in the stakeholders. That already happens, but we need to do it a lot more, bringing in the experts that can give us the advice in all of these areas. Information systems, a massive change. That's information systems within PSM. Some of the small shops, they have barcode scanners. Why don't our clinics have barcode scanners? 
Why don't our small stores and warehouses have barcode scanners for inventory so that we can have real time data? We have to advocate much more, much better for information systems. And we're back to Moore's law. The computing power is there. Most mobile phones now can bar scan. We don't need a huge big computers anymore to do it. We need to adopt simple systems using technology to support the supply chain. New technology, not just for health products, but for the supply chain itself. Well, how does this look? Strategy driven, a lot more investment. But to get that investment, we have to advocate. We have to tell people what we need. And we've not been good at doing that. We have to put down our case, our business case for what we need to do. If you want to do this, then supply chain needs this. We need a procurement unit that has got this resources. We need a warehouse. We need distribution capacity all the way through the system in order to undertake it. It's not going to be easy. No minister wants to know about more money, but we have to get better at advocating, at putting forward our case. And we do that with better data, having hard evidence. Data analytics is going to become far more important in our system. And with the computing power that's now available, we should be able to harness that. Think about mobile phone barcode scanning for inventory management. Is that possible? On the edge at the moment. But in two or three years, it might be there. We should be looking. We should be advocating now for how to adopt that. Communication, far better. Many of our countries are still performs once a quarter. That's not real-time stock management. We have to move towards real-time reporting. If we, they've got a mobile phone, we can have real-time information. The technology has brought that ability to us. We have to harness and use it. And that means advocating throughout the system for it. And we use the new health technology to drive that forward. If you want this technology, we have to have technology of our own and we need this in our system. Infrastructure, the scenario modeling, what if? If you want this health technology, we need this. And that means a supply chain that's able to put the scenario models together and cost them with evidence and advocate them. Product selection is difficult. All these new products, highly complex. Far greater product knowledge. Again, doesn't mean you in the supply chain need to know every product. But you have to be able to work with stakeholders, recognize when you need more information and bring them on board to work with you. The same on market awareness. Who knows what's happening? The WHO market shaping programs being aware of what's available. Health technology assessments, not that you need to do the health technology assessments, but that you are aware of what they are and how they impact the system. And again, these what if scenario buildings. If you choose this product, what if the impact on the supply chain, this is the scenario, this is the model that we need. Quantification and forecasting, you won't have any consumption data because they're all new. We'll have to use morbidity data to start with. But we'll need much better real-time reporting systems, much better order tracking to be able to see what's happening. Procurement, reliable pricing. What's the price on these new products? You won't find it in the International Drug Price Indicator Guide. They're too new. We're going to have to have guidance from that, and that means knowing where the guidance is. Looking at the WHO guidance sheets, looking at how they compare with what's on the market. Distribution, major changes. Again, looking at this last mile delivery, the POC, the point of care. That's the big change. 
before we sent diagnostics to the laboratory. But the point of care was at the bedside. Now you can do diagnostic testing at the bedside with these rapid kits. So we need delivery to the point of care. Major increase in delivery volumes, more transportation required. Knowing exactly where I need to go. Being prepared for the changes. Rational medicine use, product awareness, having that in place ready, and full pharmacovigilance programs. We're introducing new products. We're introducing new medicines. They're new. We're not 100% sure how they're going to react, how they're going to work. So pharmacovigilance becomes critical in these times. Adverse reaction, adverse event reporting mechanisms. Far more important. Quality assurance. How are you going to do the quality assurance on these new lamb kits? They're all new. So we need systems in place to look at quality assurance. What are the standards? How am I going to do testing and analysis? What's the early warning system for alerts? They're all new. So I have to build systems into place ready in order to do that. What are the international testing laboratories that can do quality assurance on these items? Not that, again, you personally must know, but you must know where to find out this information, how to access it, and that it's required. Key performance indicators, KPI, the existing KPI actually should be fine. Working with them, the difference will be in real-time reporting knowing what's available now. Well, how are we doing? Are we prepared for this, these areas, this major change, these major reforms? Not really. We've got to come together. We've got to recognize the impact of new health technology and then got to start modeling and planning for it, step by step as it comes to us. And that means being able to do the modeling. We all most of us remember healthcare is a human activity. Technology is important, but it's never going to replace the need for human care. We have to try and get that technology access and delivery to where it's needed. If we're going to target the poorest people in the world who are in the most need of this technology, we have to look at how we're going to achieve it. And that means major reforms, extra capacity, opening new methods, new approaches, this patient centric approach. Well, what about the impact downstream? Everyone's learned, spent money on the research. They spent any money on getting PSM ready? Well, of course not. They've researched the new health products, but we haven't got PSM ready. It's not recognized. So we're going to have to advocate for it. We're going to have to let people know. If you want access, you've got to scale up supply chain as well. It's no good just inventing new items. You have to have a mechanism to get them to the patient. And that's a neglected area, which is why we have to advocate for it. What is this, sorry, approach that we're talking about? You can see it from the access and delivery partners. It means all players and all stakeholders involved. We need an integrated approach. It can't just be PSM on its own. We have to bring in all the players. PSM may have to take the lead, but it's got to be all players coming on board. We start with the health technology policy and we need PSM in that. We don't advocate, they won't put anything in it. We have to make sure that PSM goes into that. Regulatory control, we need PSM inputs into that. Health technology assessments, we don't do them, but we have PSM inputs into the assessments. 
Supply chain management is what we do. Delivery research. Are we really getting it through to where it's needed? Integrated approach, working with all the stakeholders together. And we've not been good at doing that in the past. We have to change to allow that integrated approach. What do we need to make it work? Well, we need country ownership. Country has to take ownership of the technology, and that means having a clear healthcare technology policy. Only about 20% of countries do. That's the starting point. But don't let them write it alone. We have to have PSM inputs so that we advocate for the impacts of this new health technology. If you want this new health technology, you've got to strengthen, you've got to fund supply chain as well. That is the point and the main advocate of the health technology. Who's got one of them? 50% of countries don't have anything. Another half of those have only got a few lying items, not very much in the health technology policy. So first job, a clear health technology policy, which includes procurement and supply chain management issues. What's in this policy? Clear policy and regulatory framework. For the medicines, we're used to specifying the standard, USP, BP, EP. But what about the devices? What's the standards for those? We've got to have a regulatory framework for those as well. Evidence-based priority setting of appropriate health technologies. That is the health technology assessments, HTA. We don't have to do them, but we have inputs into them about what the procurement supply chain implications are for a product. About delivery, where is the bottlenecks in the delivery? Where am I going to be able to get these new vector control products? How am I going to get them through? Think about all the difficulties we had on bed nets because of the sheer volume. What about new products? How am I going to handle those? And finally, the pharmacovigilance. So the bottom line message around this policy is that you need to work with a lot of stakeholders and players who don't understand PSM. And frankly, many of them don't want to know about PSM. We're going to have to advocate with all of them. Every doctor will just say, I want, I want, I want, up to you to get it. We have to advocate for the role of PSM in that area and make it clear in every policy, in every procedure around the health technologies. So what is the role of PSM? First of all, reliable information and sourcing. What is this item? Is it available? What's the cost? Clear specifications. How are you going to get it? Are you going to buy it? Are you going to rent it? Are you going to pay for service? How is that going to come about? How are you going to pay for it? What's the scope of the contract? What about these health technology assessments? What information do I as PSM need to provide for those? How am I going to store it and distribute it in the country? How am I going to receive the goods on site and accept them? What about all the training of the staff? And how am I going to monitor the supply chain with all the KPI to monitor and check everything is flowing correctly? Well, what about this new technology? Well, there are guiding documents to assist on what is useful for low income countries. And what isn't? We're using the term low resource settings now. These are WHO documents, which gives you a list of the new technology and analyzes it. You don't have to know every item. What you have to know is that there is guidance available on where to go for, where to go to when you need it. So the way the WHO system is set up is there's a series of icons. You can see on the top left, a little green square with a white arrow in it. That's a recommended item. There's a sort of orange triangle, which use caution. And then there's a red circle with a white cross, not recommended. 
And that's there for a whole series of different areas. And on the right, you can see regulatory assessment. Is that good? Technical evidence, innovation, local production possible. All the different areas are considered by WHO, and they then come up with an overall recommendation. And that's available for some of the new health technologies, and they publish quite regularly about every year, these activities. So here's an example. This is a new technology, new type of cold pack for blood transportation. How is it working out? Well, the regulatory assessment wasn't so good. And the overall recommendation is with caution. So they're saying medically it works okay, it's safe, organization it's okay, it's not very environmentally friendly, and it's rather expensive. So on the economy, you can see, oh, not very good. So they're not recommending it. You say you can use it, but it's not really that great. That's the kind of regulatory assessment so that you don't have to do it. This is done, and you then pass that on to the Health Technology Assessment Committee. But you know how to find it. You know where to get this information. Here's another example. This is a piece of equipment. It's a fetal heart monitor. The advantage of this one is it's wireless. But if we look at the regulatory assessment, bottom right, not recommended. Why is it not recommended? Medically, it's got a green. Safety, it's green. Well, economy, it's got two reds. It's just too expensive. $8,000 for a fetal heart monitor because it's wireless. Do you really need a Bluetooth monitor? Will a bit of wire make all that difference? A, a normal fetal heart monitor, less than $1,000. $8,000 for Bluetooth, it's not worth it. So this item gets a no. The technology assessment is being done there. So. For you as PSM, you can refer to that and say, oh, there's the price. I already know what the price is. It's there. there. I can look at the market. Yeah, it's on the market. It's available. It's been certified or it's not been certified. Everything, all the little information is there, but it's not recommended because of the cost. Here's another one. It's not all flashing lights and bright equipment. When we talk about health technology, remember, it's everything. This is an endotracheal tube. We have lots of them, all different sizes, a breathing tube with a little balloon on it. How is this one? Bottom right, can you see the technology evidence assessment is recommended? Why is it recommended? Because it's a lot safer. Yeah? And it doesn't cost a lot more. Yeah. So I've got the assessments there available to me from WHO on which new technologies might be coming along in the future. Is it on the market? Has it been certified? Has it got ISO? Has it got a clear quality standard? That information is available. Not that you personally have to use it, but you know where it is. You can pass it on to the stakeholders who are involved in this kind of activity. Okay, so the summary is there's going to be a lot of impacts in this new health technology. It's going to add to the burdens. I've got to learn to advocate now, starting now, for my supply chain, if I'm going to be able to handle this new technology. Many of the changes that we need are already long overdue. We should be taking them now. It's difficult when we're just coming out of COVID. We've already been massively disrupted, but we've got to try and get together and do modeling and un be ready. When people suggest new health technology, we can look at, ah, if you want that, this is what we will need. We will need this infrastructure, we will need this, and we'll need this much money. Doing that kind of modeling, be ready for it. And asking for that money. I say, PSM plans the global fund. Don't ask for money. They all ask for the commodity. PSM is not asking for any money for strengthening. That's got to change. Okay. We're at our second Q&A session just on time.
Okay, so have we got anything in the chat box? A lot of wastage in unused health commodities such as ARVs when change lines. How to solve this issue? Well, you try and phase out, and again, it's a case of advocating for PSM. Often people aren't aware of what's in stock. They're not used to asking. We have to advocate for PSM issues. We have to be able to make a clear case, the scenario building, a model with financial costs. If you change lines, it's going to cost you this much in wasted stock. Yeah, can we go to mix, please? Yeah. Okay. Okay. The health technologies are too expensive on PSM and difficult to access them. How governments must be convinced by the PM experts to allow more fund for acquisition and management. Well, usually for acquisition and management, it's the clinicians. They'll push and push and push the government to adopt them. PSM has got to learn to advocate. It's not been doing that. It's a skill that traditionally PSM people haven't had. They've got to start bringing that forward. In a way, COVID has helped us because it's brought the importance of supply chain. Because of the massive disruption that supply chain suffered, the importance of supply chain is more recognized. And we have to build on that to advocate, to say this is what's needed. Not all the health technologies are too expensive. Some are cost effective. And it's a case of the health technology assessments making that decisions. It's not something we as supply chain do, but we provide supporting information on what it's going to cost the supply chain if those new technologies are adopted. Okay. See if we have anything else in the... Waste management, okay. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. If you want to raise your hand or enter a question in the chat box, I will try and answer it. Okay. Last mile delivery versus point of care delivery finding it difficult to carry out. Don't you think bringing the point of care delivery is asking for too much? Well, <laughs> how do you treat patients? You do it at point of care. We can't ask the doctor to sit in the warehouse. <laughs> we have to take the goods where they're needed. It's a massive change, but it's happening. It's already happening in the high income countries and it will come to us in the low income countries as well. We have to try and prepare for it. There are different strategies in how to do it. It doesn't mean that we have to take a big 40 ton truck to deliver the last mile, but it does mean we have to look at strategies to deliver the last mile. Point of care, I think that's gonna come more and more, but we have to try and adapt to the technology for that. And we should be able to do it. Okay, if you want to raise your hand or type something in the chat box. Okay, so just while we're waiting, let's take an example of the point of care. Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, Ronald Kalisa. Yes, please unmute and ask your question. Yes, thanks very much, Professor. Um, my question would be, 
you know, we're looking at uh, shrinking um, funding when it comes from uh, uh, donors or international uh, organizations that usually fund uh, some of these activities in low-income countries. Um, so overall, we're looking at uh, this demand for us to to, to increase uh, uh, the, the the amount available to uh, take on the supply chain activities and adapt these new technologies, but again, in the same time, there's shrinkage in the amount that is um, you know available for these activities. But I wonder, um, as supply chains become more uh, efficient. Uh, much of it owed to also improvements in technologies, but also improvements in, uh, in, in knowledge and management, administration around supply chain. So we have lesser wastages, we have um, maybe better managed supply chains that are going to reduce costs in the long run or are already reducing certain costs. Will that counteract the shrinkage in, in uh, um, funding that's available for, for supply chain technologies, or how will that play in terms of um, uh, giving us like some sort of age against um, lack of adequate funding? Okay, let's take that in, in different parts. Donors are cutting back commodity funding. They're not actually cutting back funding for supply chain strengthening because generally they're not asked for any. Donors will support increased funding for supply chain strengthening because they see it as a way of moving away from commodity funding. It's the commodity funding, paying for the ARVs, paying for the bed nets, paying for the diagnostic kits that they want to move away from. In order to move away from that, we need better supply chains. The problem is we haven't been asking for any money for the supply chain. Again, if we look at the global fund requests, it's all commodities. There's nothing there about the supply chain. There's nothing that says we need a new warehouse. We need new distribution trucks. It's all about commodities. We've not been asking for money. We have to change that to be asking for money. And I think in the medium term, donors are likely to support supply chain strengthening because they see it as a way to transition away from the commodities. I think that's part of it. Will the supply chain become more efficient? Yes, it has to. But in order to become more efficient, it needs large investment. And that's why we need to lever the donors now over the medium term when they might be willing to do that. And particularly at this time, post-COVID, when COVID has exposed just how fragile our supply chains are. So it's a case of advocating and pushing. I've been trained for 40 years. <laughs> so now I have to hand over to you and get you to try and do the advocating and the pushing to do that. We've seen some progress, we've seen some improvements, but it is difficult. It's a new approach. We're not used to advocating. We're used to coping and we have to change that approach now to advocate, to explain, to model what we need. Okay, Wango Francis, please unmute and ask a question. Thank you, Prof. Uh, I was thinking how to phrase my question and then Kalisa came up with the, the introductory part of the question I was thinking about. I get the impression that our donors are giving with the, the, the left hand and uh, retrieving with the right hand. Uh, these donors are in countries where systems have been put in place and these systems work. And part of the success of these systems have to do with adequate funding of uh, PSM activities and strengthening of PSM capacity. Uh, one of the observations you keep making is that PSM, our PSM uh, setting doesn't request for funding. These donors know that funding is needed in these areas of strengthening PSM. 
uh, and the the lay emphasis on com making available resources for commodities and downplay uh, a request that is made to them that is that doesn't capture sufficiently PSM strengthening activities. Why doesn't it start from there at the top to say that uh, we are we are we are reorienting our funding? So whatever you put up as a as a grant or as a request should have an X percent. I know that some funding bodies do that, but why is there not an insistence on this aspect of PSM funding instead of expecting advocacy from a system that is not really well connected to that already? That's one part of the question. The other part is that on the field, we notice that uh, some of these commodity funded aspects of, of, of PSM from donors uh, are accompanied by technologies that like one of the questions here raised, where in a couple of months later, these become redundant. Tablets, use of uh, uh, other devices, where by the time you get to the field six months after, it's no longer working. So supposedly huge amounts of monies have been spent, but these monies have been spent to buy items from those countries, sent to our countries, low and middle income, low middle income countries. And at the end of the day, the, 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 the impact is not really measurable over time. Are there not ways of looking at this to have locally tailored solutions? Thank you. Right, okay. All right, uh, donors are aware, yes they are. But if we look at the Global Fund Procurement Supply Channel Supply Management Plan, Section 1.1, the first section. Do you require support? Do you require strengthening? And everyone ticks no, 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 no. So they are trying. Sorry, Prof. I'm I think not they could do a lot I'm more. Sorry. A lot <laughs> I'm better. sorry. Right. That should in not the, be the question. The global... It's evident. <laughs> it's evident <laughs> that there is need for support. That question right. is but... not relevant. It, it is it's evident because, that there is a huge <laughs> gap, and the, it's measured by the Global Fund even. They yes, are reports, their assessments. Is, they is, have but, that report, and they have that assessment, and they have the capacity to say, we have assessed this system, and these are the gaps identified, and this is what we think from the examples we have in developed countries. That's how it has worked, and that is how it's going to work for you people. We, we have tried and tried and tried with Global Fund and others. The, the one area where we've had some success, of course, is USAID and their programs have, have done that. And so, to some extent, UNDP and the UN has also helped to do that as well. So that's been some success, okay. but I agree. But donors will always take the one, the request must come from the country. One of the things we're asked for is, why don't we have more scholarships for our courses? Because every time we go to UNDP and the other global agencies, they say, no one's requesting them. No one's asking us for them. That's why you don't get any. <laughs> and we have that regular argument. It's obvious, <laughs> it's evident we need them. <laughs> but they say okay. people are not asking for them. So we have to try and learn to advocate. It's difficult, I know. Uh, the, the second part was um, a little more difficult around that. That's a bit more political about how we achieve that. But I think we'll have to leave that for another time. Uh, okay. All right. I had one question in the chat box, I think. Uh, okay, Modest, you've got your hand up. If you have a quick question, I think we've just got a few minutes left. You want to unmute? Hello, Prof. Yes, um, I don't have a question. I just wanted to comment on what uh, Francis yeah. said. So um, the issue now 
here is not uh, about uh, the request or the need. Uh, I mean, uh, of donors not receiving the request, the thing is, uh, you know, there are cooperative agreements and different types of agreements that donor, donors have with different countries. And most of the time, it's just uh, that countries that are requesting, they don't put it formally, you know, they will not sign an official request because that that has an implication, uh, you know, in terms of uh, uh, what what are the 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 other aspect of of the financial support that they need. You know, uh, it's not free. Of course, you will request uh, funding from a donors, but there is what they call contraparty. So it's it's that's that's where there is uh, an, an issue. And most countries they don't feel. Uh, they don't really feel that they need to invest in 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 the in the health system strengthening, whereas they don't have sufficient funds to procure drugs. For example, that's why they will uh, prioritize drugs, knowing that uh, that is very expensive. And yeah, so that's that's what I wanted to add on top of what uh, Francis and other uh, uh, colleagues already said. Thank you. And that donors, most of donors are there to drive the market, like <laughs> create the demand, yes, I, I, to maintain oh, the business, etc. So it's not a matter of asking for support and then receiving it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. I I, I don't I wouldn't credit donors with too much of driving the market. I don't think they're that switched on. I think they would be, but no, they're not. It's not a case of honesty. It's a case of they're just not switched on. One final point, because it's been raised here, is around the URL links in the training modules. Let me say again, I think I've said it at least 10 expert sessions, it is impossible to keep a URL link open for more than a few hours. Impossible. WHO, World Bank, the UN agencies are relocating all the documents every few days. It's completely impossible to keep links current. But all the materials that you need are downloaded to the reading section and to the reference material section in every module. It's there in the module, in the reference material section. So if the link doesn't work, then I'm afraid that's reality. No link works for more than a few days. It just doesn't work. WHO, even before COVID, we're archiving material all the time with the avalanche and the vast amount of reports during COVID. Everything went into different servers all over the world. It's all archived somewhere, but finding it is difficult. That's why we have downloaded everything that's needed for the module into the reading material folder and into the reference material folder. Look in there, you will find the documents. Anything missing in there, we'll get it. It's not easy, but we download it particularly and we keep it on the Empower servers so that it's available ready. So URL links, they will not stay open for more than a few days, especially WHO, especially World Bank. Okay, we're over time now, so I will say good night to you. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, Priya has already put the link on for the slide. No, deck. sir. Uh, thank you for the excellent session and thank you all for joining it. Thank you, sir. Okay, I think you've already put the link on for the slide deck. So Yes, yes. I have already okay. shared the PPT with all uh, all of the uh, attendants and then I shared it on email as well. Okay, then I can say good night to all. Okay. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you, sir. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.